Next presentation is focusing on the Chavis family tree, and this will be presented by Mr. Frank Cooper. He is the son of Barbara Ch Chavis, originally from Wakala, and Hilton Cooper, originally from South Hope. His maternal grandparents are Reverend Godwin Chavis and Bonnie Woods. His paternal grandparents are Henry Cooper and Inez Locklear. Mr. Cooper has a Bachelor of Arts, a double major in American Indian Studies and History from UNCP. Uh, he also holds a master's degree in education from the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. He currently teaches American Indian, uh, I'm sorry, American Indian Studies at Hope County High School. Mr. Cooper has served as vice chair for the Hope County Indian Education Parent Committee for several years and board of directors for the Hawkeye Indian Cultural Center for several years. Since 2008, Mr. Cooper has served as a club advisor for Native American Student Association in Hope County. He is an American Indian, I'm sorry, a member of the Native American Mentor Program at Hope County High School, and he also volunteered as a speaker for the North Carolina Native American Youth Organization for the past 10 years. He is a proud member of the Native American fraternity, Phi Sigma Nu. Are there any Phi Sigma Nu men in here? Mm -hmm. Last two right there. <laughs> 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 he serves, <laughs> serves as Lumbee Tribal Council Representative for Hope County. He currently serves as chairperson on the Indian Education and Cultural Committees for the Lumbee Tribal Council. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Frank. Yeah. So, Tanaki, Tianudu, Nayak, Frank Cooper. Hello, how are you doing? My name is Frank Cooper. <laughs> Um, when I was originally asked to do this, um, and then she said, Chavis, oh, I was, I was you know, no, that's what I do. That's what I love. I, you know. And then, I was, when I at the college, I'm in my automobile, you know, some of my professors might be there, <laughs> you know. Then I get here and I see you guys and hear some of you talk, and professional genealogists, oh, God. Oh God, by no means is anybody any better than anybody else. And I've heard people say already, when you're doing research, uh, some of it's subjective, like um, Ancestry.com might say, well, this person is a child of this person, but there's no birth certificate, you know, there's no marriage record on that person or whatever, but they're seeing this. So I might point that out during my presentation because uh, by no means, if, if unless you have documents, and you know our people didn't do that, so unless there's a document, um, then it is subjective. So I told my buddy, Byron, uh, I know everybody's seen this picture, 1910 Red Man's Lodge, but I just want everybody to know that most of those guys are chases. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I wanted to point that out. Mr. Abner is my great-grandfather's first cousin. And uh, then we have family members of these other fellas here in the class. And then, I mean, I'm sorry, I teach. <laughs> and then we have Mr. George Washington Bell, when we had some bells in here earlier. So I thought that was pretty cool. So when you do genealogy, if you do one family, you just, uh, a lot of times you think of it this way. And I, and I put this together, and I was like, nah, I don't want to do that. You know, there's no faces, and you know, this, you know, no, no maps, no faces, no places. I said, I don't really. Really want to do that, but this is this is my line. It starts with my mother and her father Godwin, Mr. Tom, uh, Reverend Tommy, his father Richard, and on, on back to Huey. And, um, almost every one of us is related through Mr. Huey. If you have any check to see him. you know them folks back then that have anywhere between 15 and 20 kids. Somebody's got to work farm. <laughs> This is my mom. She's the boss. I had to make sure I put her in here. But this is this is her as a I think she said eighth grade, and then you know she was maybe close to thirty here, and, and this is now. So I want to make sure I pay tribute to my mom. All right. She's very pretty. All right. All right. My my grandfather Godwin Chavis, who used to be a pastor at Youth for Christ in Max in North Carolina. He had and raised 19 children. Right. Um, <laughs> um, that's why, and somebody said it earlier, you, you need to know who's your people. Because yeah. <laughs> she's cute, 
Don't mean you can talk to her. <laughs> if, it, if it's any closer, if it's third or closer, forget it. <clears throat> and then uh, his father, uh, Mr. Tommy, Reverend Tommy, what, where did his name go? Oh, anyway, Reverend Tommy Chavis, Avis Pastor at Cherokee Chapel, New Prospect, New, uh, New Bethel. Mr. Tommy, along with other folks, were instrumental in creating the Holiness Methodist Conference. Him and his father, and Mr. George Peavy, which is an ancestor of my distinguished cousin over here. <clears throat> but this is the first church. Uh, this picture, I think it's of 1916. But Richard Chavis was a Tommy's father, and he was, he was instrumental in creating all these, helping create these churches. Of course, he didn't do it on his own. And the first church over there that's right uh, um, around Cherokee Chapel, oh well, Oxnard Elementary School, um, the, the land was donated by the Oxnard family. And Miss Oxnard was actually a Lowry. And Calvin Lowry, the brother of Henry Barry Lowry, was one of the first preachers at the church. And I was just telling somebody earlier, it just shows you how we're all connected. You do a DNA test, no, it's not really going to tell you much about your Native American heritage, but it's going to tell you that your fourth or fifth cousin is really your second cousin. Because <laughs> you are connected more than just one time. I have like 350 trees that I've done and helped do with students. You know, if they're Native American students, each and every single one are related. Now, they may not be first, second, or third cousins, but a quill a quick Hugh Chavis, or definitely Ishmael, somebody's going to connect you somewhere along the way. So, we at, at this point in time, Chavis family, the name is cross racial barriers. It's within every community in the United States: white folks, black folks, and native folks. But where does native, where does indigenous heritage of the uh, Chavis family come from? Mr. Zimi, and I think we have some of his relatives in here, made a statement that uh, his uh, grandfather was the last of the chief among his people around the Shiraz area. And in a, in a document, I think Lawrence mentioned this earlier, they might write it down, an oral tradition, because you know Mr. Zimi actually signed this, but he signed an X, if I'm not mistaken, so he didn't write it. Somebody was listening, and they wrote it. They actually wrote the tribe down as Cherokee. Right. In the Shiraz area of South Carolina. Right. That makes no sense. But that's what they wrote, and that's the reason why you have to pay attention to these documents. Some of it is subjective. Mr. Cam Chase transcribed that. It does make sense, though, if you were going down a little bit further into South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. And especially West. Because they had uh, Cherokee tribes down there. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, some of the stories I've heard people talk about old traditional stories, and one that I remember the most about Mr. Zimmy was the fact that this man was so religiously dedicated that he would walk to Georgia to preach. Now, you know, most of our folks wouldn't walk to the church on Sunday to party, <laughs> much less walk to Georgia. <laughs> And the first strike at the wind, uh, uh, what do they call it, books, programs? Programs had Mr. Zimmy's picture on it. It was, uh, I think I got it like in the early 80s or late 70s or something. I was a little kid. And then my mother told me about that. So that was one of the old stories in our family. So I held on, I still have the book. And I wanted to pay Mr. Zimmy tribute. But his father, Preston, um, was my great grandfather's brother. He said Mr. Zimmer could blow the car out and he got burned. Mm -hmm. He could draw the car out of us. <laughs> uh, this girl I went to school with, her son got burned a little bit. It took him over there. And he blew the car out of his arm and he didn't even have a car. Wow. <laughs> yeah, uh, there used to be people, uh, uh, sprinkle across our communities that could do things. There was some spiritually connected. They could do yeah. things like that. And, um, I know Mom Vernon could do things like that, but you don't see that as much as you used to. It is sad that the, that the way they uh, were allowed to do that, only those who had never known or seen their biological father could do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Not getting in that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before. 
before the other day. I've heard that before. Who was the last time he read? Yes. So those are just some of the old stories, but I knew there was some Zimmy descendants in here. I didn't want to mess any of that up. <laughs> so I said the one I knew my mother told me that, oh, he walked to Georgia. Well, everybody was like, wow, he walked to Georgia to preach. Boy, that, now, hey, that, now that's a Christian, but I don't want to judge anybody. I'm just saying. Um, Ishmael Chavis, well, it, it, he was talking about Ishmael Chavis, and Ishmael Chavis for a while lived in South Carolina. And in fact, they have a community down there now, and it's a little sign. It's not a great big old welcome to this community. It's a little sign like this, Chavis Town. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Marlboro County, around Bennisville. This is where Ishmael first came to when he came south. But he did not stay there, and he was not from there. Matter of fact, this is subjective. This is what Lawrence was talking about earlier when you find stuff on Ancestry.com. If you can't find the documents, just point that out. Ancestry.com says he's a relative of Ishmael, Lazarus Chavis. He went down towards Orangeburg County, mm -hmm. South Carolina, and became the ancestor, almost the majority of the people down there called the Beaver Creek PD Indians. But when you go check Ancestry.com, Ishmael would only be 10 years old when Lazarus was born. <laughs> I don't even know if that's possible. No. But the fact remains that he is a Chavis. He was recognized back then as one of the PD Indians because he, he was in the Revolutionary War and he was awarded or they paid him with a land grant down there. So most of the people down there now descend from him. And they call themselves the Beaver Creek PD Indians. Coincidentally, the area he come from, or is said he came from, or the Ishmael was living, people there also called themselves PD or PD Sharal or Sharal. The Sunker Sharal Indians has a strong connection to the Chavis family as well. It's uh, obviously the Sunker Sharal or in Sunker, South Carolina, a little bit ways uh, in a different direction than the other guys. But one of the core names there is Chavis. Chavis, uh, this is said to be John, uh, Ishmael's brother too, which would have been John. John went down there and they're along with four or five other guys and some guys, uh, a Bellamy guy from the Middle East, created this community. Something Shroud. And what I'm trying to do is show you that the Chavis name, along with many of our other names, jump tribes that go from here to there. It's not just because you're a Chavis don't mean you're this or that, but it means your ancestors probably come from here. Before leaving South Carolina, he, le he left a legacy there because there's a community called Chavis Town. And there's multiple people called Chavis down there. And some of them don't claim to be in it because in South Carolina, when they were going up, you were in the white or black. Ishmael and Ishmael's father came from a small reservation in Granville, North Carolina. It's a Saponi reservation, and the land was issued to those folks by a guy named Colonel William Eaton. E A T O N. Colonel William Eaton had a muster roll. If you look at the names on his muster roll, you have Harris, Chavers, obviously that's Chavers. Godwin, Davis, and Burnell. Now, I'm all about the Davis and the Burnell. I know we have some Lumbies with Davis, but not Burnell. But the Godwin, Godwin is like Chavis and Lowry and Lockwood. It's spelled so many different ways, but it's the same families. Or it goes, or it goes back to the same families. But here is a map that I received from Kev, Kevin Ray Oxenine, who is a genius at doing genealogy. And it shows where Ishmael's father, William, owned land adjoining to that Saponi Reservation. So this muster roll over here lists, yeah, lists William Chavis as a Negro. Of course, we know how it was back then, mm -hmm. especially if you were mixed. If you were mixed, you can be free colored Negro, or mulatto, either one. And depending on who's taking the census on top of that. that William Chavis Jr. was listed as mulatto. Just so happens in Virginia in 1705, they passed the law saying you can be white or in white and Indian, white and black, or black and white, and you're still going to be listed as mulatto. 
So they were using the word to mean mixed. In the sense of being mixed. So I'm not sure about senior William Savage, but Junior must have been half the pony. Well, what connects us to the Hollowasa Pony people in Halifax and Warren County? They have Chavis ancestry. If you go back, the first name on there is Edward Harris. Edward Harris, a Suwannee Indian, whether he was Sherald, Catawba, or Saponi, was in that same community and married Sarah Chavis. Sarah Chavis, or him and Sarah Chavis had a child, and their descendants are now Richardson's. <laughs> See how we're all cousins? <laughs> I, it's amazing how the government pits us against each other when we're actually all related. Um, some of this information I received from a buddy of mine, Kane Lewis, formerly of Cornell University. Um, I knew about Edward Harris and Sarah Chavis, but I did not know those were the ancestors of the Richardson family. There were two Richardson, there were two brothers. One of the brothers married the, one of the daughters of those, that couple there, and you know how many Richardsons are if you know anything about Hawassa Pony. They're like a lot of Okay, I don't usually stand up and lecture. I like answering questions and open discussion, and that's what we're going to do from here. Um, how many of you learned something new that you didn't know from the PowerPoint, the short PowerPoint I presented today? Raise your hand. Any questions? Yes, sir. What were those rivers that uh, you showed on the last map? One here. Is that the little PD? No, no, sir. It's up around Granville County, around the borders of That's Virginia. That's what I thought. Yeah. Because, uh, I, I don't. I really didn't. I didn't really put everything into this. I wanted to, because after Fort Christiana, uh, Christiana um, school closed in Virginia, the Saponi and Tulu and Okanichi people that were there disbanded. Some went to Ohio. Some, some went to the Air Force and Fairfield up north. Some went on out to um, Canada. Some stayed there. Some went up to Tennessee and become what they call Melungeons or Melungeons today. But there were Saponi people, and they were from the borders of. Virginia and North Carolina. And this is where this is located, this little map here. Where did the rivers go? I imagine it's all river goes all the way up. Yeah, the car. Yeah, of course, but did they come down here? No, no, no sir, no, sir. So they go into the outer mall. Oh, yeah. Okay, I got it. Um, somebody had it. Well, yes, sir. That, that name Gowen up there, G O, it's just W E N. My yes, sir. Uh, my grandmother was listed as Margaret Gowen, G O I N S. She married Malcolm Locklear Holmes. And that Gowen and Gowen is the same name. I mean, basically the same yes, name. Yes, it is. Some, I mean, you don't want to offend people. Right. Especially if their name spelled different because the Lowry is with the E and the Lowry is without E. Right. It's claimed they're not the same people. But when they do their ge genealogy, they go directly back to the first line was here, which is James Lowry and Sarah Curzon. And all the families, whether it's I-E or E-R-Y or other. Right. So the Goins are the same way. The okay. Goins, they're, they're out of Virginia and they cross every tribe now. I mean, there's Goins right. that are Cherokee. Um, the reason I, ask, I don't have much information at all on her. It just stopped at 8. She born 1804. Mm -hmm. He was born in 1803. But... Anyway, they got together, and that's where I came from, somewhere down the line. But I, I, I've seen the, the, that going before, and I didn't associate with it. Would be, it would be the same as going back to Yes, sir. And, ever who took the and there's uh, one or two other ways they spell it as okay. well. Yes, okay. ma'am. Thank you. Which spelling is acceptable and which is recognized? Is the ancient spelling recognized? And we know how uh, surnames get changed. It's by uh, enumerators. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and I just came through a, a big battle uh, last year for about that. I'm a great boy. Mm -hmm. And the ancient spelling of my surname is with a V. And I have documentation, certified document documentation to that effect. And then it became a brave boy. 
So I didn't drop for, uh, add, you know, just added a Y. I'm, I'm presuming there's a V, somebody chose to put a, a Y, a leg on the V. And then it became two Ys, and it became a very issue. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather, great, 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 great grandfather, Isaac Gray, Grayboy, is a co-founder of this university. Mm -hmm. And his name is incorrectly put on the instrument, the mace, mm -hmm. if you will. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and I felt very sad that his name was dishonored because all his life, he spelled his name and wrote his name, surname, with one Y. But this university chose, chose to put, misspell his name. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to get that out there. Um, <laughs> actually, Isaac Brave Boy, Brave Boy is also my ancestor through my grandfather Goblin on his mother's side. And I understand what you're saying. And but I think the official or the uh, accepted spelling of any one of our names is how the family spells it. Because um, you have cousins that are Demrys that spell it with an I and then they spell it with an E and they're all first cousins. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the family and who you're speaking with. Um, old tradition in the Cooper family is that the Coopers adopted the mother's name and the father was actually a brave boy. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, so really quick, so I was going to look at that, was that Burnell down there? So do you ever, do you ever wonder if maybe that was uh, turning to Burnett or had any kind of connection to Burnett? Well, you know, we have names that, that I haven't had a chance to research them all, but yeah. you got Ma Manuel and Emanuel, you got Brewer and you got Brewington, you got Hammond, you got Hammonds, and it just goes on and on and on. And you can't help but to think, Somewhere, some census taker wrote it down wrong because that's what he heard or didn't know how to spell it right, which might have been the case with Mr. Isley, and that's what it became, the same way with the Lowry name. Um, we have people from several tribes, including the Wakaman, the Lumbee, and the Coherent, and they're all last named Jacobs, when it used to be Jacob, <coughs> Jacob's son. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And sometimes when you were born, the nurses had the letters to the doctor. Mm -hmm. They would put on the birth certificates a different spelling. Mm -hmm. They wrote what they heard. Right. Yeah. They wrote it the way they heard it. Mm -hmm. Take for instance, my name is Deborah Ann McMillan. And uh, my mom said, your name is Deborah Ann McMillan. But mom, on my birth certificate, it's D-E-B-I-S-A-N-N-Debbie-San McMillan. Wow. So well, when I went to get they changed the birth certificate of Bennett, it would cost $300 then. Oh, yes, yeah. It's very expensive. It's probably about to get along. But Lord's will want to get that done. I actually thought about changing my name to Chavis until I figured out how much it costs now. <laughs> that can all be done pro se. You do not have to, in the state of North Carolina, you do not have to have an attorney to do that. You go to your local clerk of court's office and they will assist you in that. Most of them have packages already pre pre done. You find pay your filing fee and you get it changed. Um, so no, you do not have to have that is a process that can be done pro se. But it's spelling, it's spelling uh, it like ma'am said there, it, it's, it's like able to meet her names, like Sweat and Sweet. They're actually the same people. Mr. Huey's wife, uh, Clarissa or Caressi, Sweat, Lowry, um, has relatives named Sweet and, and their ancestry goes all the way back up to Virginia to the Pamunkey tribe. On the sweat side. Any other questions? Comments? Yes, ma'am. Just thinking about our dialect. <laughs> That's a lot of things, yeah, you know. These people come around and hear how we say it. Yes. Of course, how yes. It's and then, to, and then, to our communities, had a slight difference in their dialect when they said the same words. Right. So you might say. Locklear over here and Locklear over here, and uh, whoever's going to see it might spell that differently. You say Locklear. Locklear, 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 Lock. Yes, sir. So, why do you think Brock is so famous down in South Carolina? Good question. What brought Ishmael Chavis? Well, that area that he went to was, has been referred to in, in uh, the Charleston Gazette as the Old Shiraz Settlement. That doesn't mean there were any Shiraz there, but it means they were at least there before, okay? But it is documented 
that the Saponi people and the Shiraz people went back and forth from the Catawba Reservation to Virginia. Okay? Well, if he left the Saponi, that little Saponi Reservation, I think Dr. A.F. Dahl even mentioned that, those folks, in his only land I know book, being around 50 people. If he left there to come down to South Carolina that used to be called the Old Shiraz Indian Settlement, and then he comes back up here, and almost all of his descendants that go south have some type of Suwan uh, PD, uh, something Shiraz, or some, some type of Suwan name. There's got to be connections between that and the Suwan Indian heritage. Now, with that said, uh, the Chavis name skipped over into Nottaway, it skipped over into the Tuscarora. There's Tuscarora, I mean, there's Chavis is buried in any woods reservation. Phil Chavis' wife actually comes from Birdie County. But was she, was she Nazma? Was she Tuscarora? Was she Saponi? Well, there was a town there called Saponi Town. Philip was living on a Saponi Indian reservation, and then they end up in the old Chiral Indian settlement. So you got to look at all those things and put them together. Those are the type of things I wanted to add in this. And then she said, well, you might get to talk like 30 minutes. I said, well, I better not add all that in there. <laughs> I'll wait on questions because we could go for days. I mean, you could just put name after name and just history and after history. Did you ever research, I I've seen different things where, where you and Reggie and uh, a couple of people have talked about the um, uh, uh, Epcot, Tewa, and Ewasa. Yeah. Did they ever have a, a clear indi indicating language group for what those words were? Did they say it was Saponi or Shiraz? Or? Well, the Saponi people that, that we refer to as Saponi were known by three different ones. They were Okanichi, uh, they were Saponi, they were Tulu. Yeah. So it's probably what you're talking about, and I don't know for sure I hadn't seen this on documentation, but that was probably Tulu. But once Fort Christiana and all that closed down, these Indians were disbanded uh, and went to different places. They became known as just the Saponi, and they obviously understood each other. And I had somebody tell me last week that the Shiraz and the Catawba and the Saponi didn't speak the same language. Well, they might not spoke exactly the same language, but they spoke close enough that they understood a each a other. Tra a trade language. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And they were all referred to at one time, I've seen that documentation, as too low because that was a, a, a northern Iroquois designation for southern Siouan-speaking tribes. Mm -hmm. Even the Catawba at one period of time was referred to as too low, so it would it would make sense if all those people were together, uh, the Kiowa and all the rest of them, they had to have some form of trade language jargon to speak, and, and I do wonder if it did make its way into Robinson County, it probably did. Well, that term did. Yeah. And I, I imagine in the early days of, of the terms, excuse me, weren't documented. Yeah. That was very good. Any other questions? Yes, sir? You want to speak at all about the Chavis line connecting with uh, the Gibson line all the way up out of Virginia and the Akamatic and the Gibson line? Miss Jane Gibson? That was referred to in the court document as, as a Native American. Well, you can. Well, her descendants are Chavises, and she and there's documentation saying that she was in and doesn't say what kind, but it was in Virginia. And um, she would be an ancestor basically of all the Chavis families. Other than that, that's all I can tell you about her. Good question, huh? Any other questions? Well, I think I'm the only one that finished early. <laughs> yes, sir? Do you have any Chavises in, known Chavises in Scotland County? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Chavis is, uh, I mean, I was watching the noon and seeing Chavis Activity Center up in Raleigh. I'm like, really? So Chavises are everywhere, from Virginia down. I actually, I haven't seen any documentation on this, but on, there was a, oh, I did on the wagon train. In 1828, I think it was, there was a wagon train that left the borders, that say North South Carolina, because we didn't really recognize those. It was just Carolina. So it left the borders of North Carolina and South Carolina and went south, all the way out to Louisiana. Well, on that list, there was Chavises, there was Jacobs, there was Scotts, there was Brooks, there's Coopers, and on and on and on. Those were our people. Well, those people now are part, they're even part of the Creole people in Louisiana. And I have heard, I haven't seen, this is what I said I didn't see documentation on, that some of the Porch Creek of Alabama who are fairly recognized have Chavis ancestors. They do. They do. They do. They do. Ma'am? Yes, ma'am. 
Chambers. Same family. Chambers Chavis. Yes, ma'am, it is. Ch Chavis, Chavers, Chivers. Someone changed the spelling to Shivers. Chavez. It's more of a southwestern thing because it's a Latin based word, but Chavis originally was a Latin based word. Uh, I've heard old stories that there was a Saponi uh, village and a Portuguese man living with him, which would be a, uh, and he was a Chav Chavez. And then obviously by the time he gets to this point, but that's oral tradition, so there's no documentation for that. Yes, ma'am? And my cousin Sandra uh, Carter, which is Greg's sister-in-law here, but she passed away. And my aunt George Bell Locklear got an opportunity to visit your grandfather. My, my grandfather's brother. Your grandfather's brother. Yes. The one that Uncle Vernon. Get for the medicine. I mean, yes. yeah, uh, get for working in medicine. Yes. But I thought I asked my cousin. I said, "Is he right?" She said, "Yeah, he's right." But you clarified that. You know, that was good. I learned that that he was Native American. Right. Right. <laughs> well, um, my Uncle Vernon told me out of his own mouth that she, he said, "You know, they were from South Carolina." Right. You know, we were. We were. Shiraz and PDs and we moved up here, Mary Lowers and Locklers, and we became Lumbees. <laughs> uh, that's why he told me, of course I was 13 or 14 years old. Then I've heard stories about him, and that's one reason why Mr. Zimi stuck with me. I've heard stories about him doing things that Mr. Zimi done, like he could actually go to the edge of the woods and bend down and pray, put his hands down and animals would come to the edge of the woods. He could blow the fire, he could smell if you had cancer. He could put his hand over you and tell you where the cancer was. He's dictated poems and books and couldn't read or write. If you miss grandchildren are here, would, I, I'm not taking, would you be kind enough to let them be recognized? Yes, yes. Would they stand? Yes, please. Mr. Zimmy Cherry's children and grandchildren. 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 Some of the stories about Mrs. Zimi, and I never met Mrs. Zimi, but I did get to meet my Uncle Vernon, and I could see some of the stories. I'm like, wow, that was a, that's the reason why I wanted to put Mrs. Zimi up here. Not just because he's one of my cousins, because there's a correlation of the, the powerful or the power this man had in his spirituality and the things he did and um, his sincerity. Yes, sir. My grandfather. Zimmy uh, would have people come to him all during the night, all during the day to be prayed on when they were sick. And I remember once when I was staying with him, uh, a couple came with a small baby that was running a very high fever. And Granddaddy prayed over him, and before he left there, the fever had broken. When you pray like that, you can do things that way. Let's not forget to give Mrs. Chavis credit. She was a midwife, yes. a granny woman. Yes. Yes. Certified by the Robinson County Health Department. Any other questions? My whole family was treated by Mr. Zemi. Anytime we had any kind of fever or congestion, chest congestion, Mom and Dad would take us to Mr. Sanders and he'd pray to pray, but sometimes he'd cry poultices uh, or warm cloths or whatever, and um, we just assumed that he was the doctor. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've heard that some people that could do things like that never even went to school one day. They couldn't read or write, and they could. They were so close in their spirituality that they could do like that because they couldn't read the Bible, but they could listen and carry and believe in it. So it was their faith that worked. It's all about spirit, still is. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Should be. I, think, uh, I think your uncle really had a lot of, uh, Mr. Vernon had a lot of sense in what he was saying when he was saying was Shrall and PD and then came up and then married Locklers and Lowry's and then became Lumbee because mm -hmm. that, that in essence, I mean, he was kind of a, uh, uh, almost kind of a forced time thinking like that because we kind of realize that a lot now, especially with the fact that really Lumbee is this coalescence of these different uh, these different tribal members that come together and that make this, this Lumbee nation, if you will, of, of Indian people. And so it's 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 quite inspiring that he, that he understood that all the way back then and talked about it. Well, he did, that's not all he said. He said that this place was known as a settlement. Mm -hmm. There were various people here 
And the reason why they came here is because in South Carolina you had to be black or white and they had relatives here. That's why they came here. Yes, ma'am? Oh, it's just like whenever, you know, you study in the word of the Lord overseas, uh, well, when the children of Israelites come out of Egypt bondage, those Egyptians that came with them, if you read, you know, church in the Bible, and y'all probably haven't read it, they became Israelites mm -hmm. whenever they come into the promised land and crossed over the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's an excerpt here from, looks like a, a pamphlet that was uh, published on uh, ministers of that era. And one of the Chavis, Zemi Chavis descendants is going to read what's here. <laughs> and it's quite outstanding and will bear proof to what you were saying yes, about Mr. Zemi. Go ahead, feel free. Reverend Zemi Chavis served as pastor for the following churches, Bear Swamp, Mount Barah, Cape Fear, Piney Hill, Galilee, Pleasant View, Gary Pond, Gray Pond, St. Peter's, I don't know where that is, Harvest Ferry, Union Light, Magnolia, Zion Hill. Licensed to preach in 1907 and ordained in 1909. <coughs> helped to organize five Baptist churches, Cape Fear, and I've heard the stories about him walking or starting to walk. He'd go on Saturday, spend the night with somebody, and come back. Galilee, Piney Hill, Union Life, Zion Hill. He did mission work in North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, and Maryland. He was known as the walking preacher because he did not have any private transportation. Wow. That takes strong willpower. Any other questions? Frank, I suppose visitors throw in too. My grandfather. On the Strickland side, was really good friends with Mr. Vernon Cooper. I mean, they were pretty tight. And uh, my granddad used to tell me stories about they would go booger hunting. <laughs> um, and tell me about different things. Does everybody know what booger hunting is? Okay. Um, booger hunting is, I guess, a lumpy term for uh, uh, chasing ghosts. Ch chasing money, too. Yeah, there were stories about they would go looking for money, and, and the story goes if. if uh, if you find it, if you say something, the money's going to disappear. And so I think he said that happened a couple times. And there were other strange things that happened. But um, but I know one time my granddad told me that they were out butter hunting. And um, my granddad would sometimes sleep on the couch. We had two couches in our living room facing each other. And he woke up one night and there was a man sitting in the couch across from him facing him. And apparently someone or something had followed him home that night from when they were out booger hunting. So uh, it's just an interesting little story there. Story in there. Oral history. Check, check. I'm not hunting no more. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.